will be a big change in the licensing laws in Ireland with pubs to open later and nightclubs given the ability to stay open until 6am. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but first I want to talk to Fine Gael TD Jennifer Carroll McNeil about a very different story uh, because a 43-year-old man who sent messages and sexually explicit videos to Jennifer was given a suspended one-year sentence in court last week. Jared Colhan admitted harassing her on various dates between January and March of 2020. Um, Jennifer, you're with me now in studio tonight as part of the panel discussion, but first we wanted to come to this story. You gave a statement um, outside court following, um, I suppose, the emergence of details about this terrifying campaign of har harassment against you, um, and Jared Colhan was handed a one-year suspended sentence. What's your reaction to that sentence? Well, look, I'm very glad that there was a conviction. I'm glad the matter is resolved and I'm clearly back to work with, with my colleagues here this evening. Um, I thought it was very important to, to take the case. I was concerned that if it was happening to me, it was happening to somebody else, maybe another woman in, my, in, in Ireland, or maybe somebody running out of the election, maybe a young woman who didn't have the same wherewithal that I did to pick up the phone to the local chief superintendent during an election and say, look, there's a problem here. Or maybe it was somebody who a court had already said not to do this and that there was potential breach of a court order. So in either case, you know, it's simply it had to be it had to be stopped so i mean i i was treated extremely well by angarda shikona there there was a, a process it took a long time but uh, there is a conviction and i think that's that's very important because some victim support groups might say you know there was a maximum of 7 years that could have been given in this instance and that jared colhan you know, should he have gotten jail time in this instance? Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen some of that commentary and I've seen it from different from, from different sources. I mean, for my part, I'm glad it's resolved. I'm glad there's a conviction. I'm glad there is an outcome. Uh, I don't really want to go further than that. I'm going to leave that to the judge. But, I, you know, it is, it's, it's for others to, to, to comment mm -hmm. on that. In this case, it's, it's about me and I'll, I'll just I'll keep it to that. But I, I certainly learned a lot through the court process. Um, you know, I have much better insight from that, even though we've spent, you know, a lot of time in the Justice Committee looking at the court process from the perspective of complaints being a complainant is a completely different thing uh, and yeah, I certainly tell, have a much us, better insight into that. Uh, tell us what that, that's like because as you say you would have you know, heard of other people's experiences but when you are there and you are going through that legal process yourself and we hear that the courts can be a very cold place um, for victims to face perpetrators. Um, how was that experience for well, I you? I think you know like any public representative here David, David Cullen is here also we all bring our own personal experience to politics and, 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 and to, to that job uh, representing people with different experiences and as you go through life you acquire more life experiences and look it is we've always recognized that that's a difficult place for a complainant to be I now have a, a you know a slightly additional insight into that as I do other things through my own life experience and you know I'll bring that with me in the future but like I just want you know it, it is it is possible to get a conviction it's very clear that it's possible to get a conviction and I you know I think this you know while while I don't welcome any of this conversation you know about myself I think it's useful to show people that you can make complaints that you will be taken seriously, that convictions are possible and that this sort of behaviour in the first instance just isn't normal and just isn't acceptable. And that's something that you clearly wanted to get across outside the courts as well as we heard in, in your statement that it's not acceptable and you're hoping that your actions and, and that what proceeded in court will help others to come forward. Um, so thank you for speaking to us on that. Now, coming back to our top story tonight and the changing of licensing laws. It would allow pubs open from 10.30 in the morning to 12.30 a.m. seven days a week while nightclubs would not have to close until 6 a.m. Now it's expected to be enacted next year if the legislation is passed by the Oireachtas and here is what the Minister for Justice had to say about it earlier. At the same time we've seen 329 off licenses open so the rural pubs that are closing are not currently being sold on in the vast majority of cases to other people opening pubs. They're actually either just disappearing or they're being sold to off licenses. So, you know, acknowledging that we need to try and support people. Well, Fine Gael TD Jennifer Carl McNeil is with me, as is Sinn Féin TD David Cullinan, Craig Hughes, political correspondent for the Irish Daily Mail, and Sheila Gilhini, the CEO at Alcohol Action Ireland. But first tonight, let's take you live to Tramlines Nightclub in Dublin City Centre, and Kira Doherty is there speaking with the industries affected by all of this. Kira. Yes, thank you, Claire. I am joined by Ian Redmond, who is the owner of Tramline, a nightclub, as you say, and music venue in Dublin city centre, and also by DJ Sunil Sharp, who has also spearheaded the Give Us the Night campaign. You're both very welcome to the programme. Uh, Ian, why has 
this change, or these proposed changes? Why have they been so warmly welcomed by your industry? Well, primarily thanks to Sunil for all the work he's done over the last decade and a half on getting us this far. Uh, nightclubbing is about going out till you want to go home and, you know, uh, people want to go out and they want to stay out late like they're allowed to do in all other European capital cities, all other cities around the world. So to have the option to stay out till 6am is fantastic. They don't have to. They can go home at 3 if they want. You know, the, uh, the hospitality staff working in the city finishing up at 12 or 1, they now have the option to go out on a Saturday night, which they didn't have before. So for a multitude of reasons, it's fantastic. It gives our staff an extra shift as well. We can hire more staff. It's a it's a boon to the exchequer then. So because there's more PAYE, PRSI employers, PRSI. So it actually doubles the amount of arrows we can trade in any given week. I'm very conscious that we are sitting here in Trampoline on a Tuesday night and it's closed. The doors are closed. I mean, will these proposed changes mean that the doors will be open seven nights a week till 6am? Is the demand there for that? Well, not as yet. There isn't the demand for it because there's not enough people living in the city and that's a planning issue. We need to get more people living in the city. I would have loved to have thrown a celebration party tonight to celebrate the fact that this is coming, but I didn't have a special exemption order so I can't open tonight because I didn't go to court two weeks ago to apply for a special exemption order to open tonight because I didn't know this was going to happen. And that's the same the world over. When we're trying to organise after parties for events, if they come from the three arena or a school's rugby match where someone's won a senior cup match, and we can't put those on on any given night if it's in short short notice because we haven't applied for SEOs. So with the new nightclub permit that's proposed, we're delighted about, it'll be an annual permit and we'll get it a year in advance and we know we can open any night we want till, uh, not saying we want to open till six every night, certainly two o'clock, three, four, but we want that opportunity to decide for ourselves when our staff uh, um, and our patrons have had enough, then we'll close, you know, so it's it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I'm delighted. you have been calling for this for a very, very long time. Um, it's seen, I suppose, as a really major step for the industry, but I know you think there's still a long way to go. Yeah, there's a, there's a long way to go in terms of time because we were hopeful that the reform, that these laws will be enacted by the end of the year. It doesn't appear that that will be the case. We would like to think that they could come that the legislation could be set and, and ready to go by early next year. That still remains to be seen. But in terms of the legislation, I mean, there's been a lot of announcements over the last two and a half years, but we're definitely going in the right direction now. And certainly even this morning, a lot changed between this morning and the media reports that were being, that were, were kind of being fed, that we, like, I mean, we were only, we were finding out about what was happening later than perhaps we should have, you know. Um, we were being informed by the media what was happening, but that seems to be, you know, that happens a lot nowadays, you know, so uh, I, I was kind of expecting that. But after the media, after the briefing with the Justice Department today, we started to become a little bit more familiar with the intricacies of this reform and some of the other aspects of the reform that perhaps weren't um, highlighted as much today in the, in, the, in the main press release that made its way to media. So we're starting to get to grips with it, but there's still some work to be done on it. And I think every interest group, every stakeholder that's involved and is a voice in this will definitely have their own feedback to give back to the Justice Department. So there is still another level of uh, engagement that still has right. to happen, but it appears like we're nearly at the final hurdle. Uh, what would you say to those who say, look, we don't have a very healthy relationship with alcohol in this country and this is, you know, quite simply going to be an opportunity for people to stay out longer and drink more and that's the last thing that we need in this country. What do you say to those people who have those concerns? Well, I'd say what's happening right now is they're those people are deciding to stay in and drink more at home. I mean, that's where the rise is happening. People are drinking more at home. They're rejecting nightlife because there isn't that diversity. There aren't the venues, the flagship venues, the landmark spots that a lot of people used to socialise, particularly with, with older generations as well. Even, and when I say older generations, I mean people from 25 and over, you know, a lot of people, particularly when they get to that age, they start to weigh up how good Irish nightlife is um, against other European countries. In fact, it's starting even earlier than that, but I think the education starts in the early 20s, even maybe, you know, late teens, people are starting to travel more, starting to see what's offer, on offer abroad, and are, are, are essentially voting with their feet and are getting out of Ireland at the weekends. In terms of alcohol consumption, our, 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 our consumption is down. It, it's, it's on a downward trajectory now. It doesn't mean that we don't
don't need to be mindful of alcohol consumption going back up. But the, the, the problem area now is in the off trade and drinking at home rather than in the on trade and in venues like this. So. All right, Sunil Sharp and Aid Redmond, uh, thank you both for taking the time to speak to us this evening. Back to you, Claire. Kira, thanks for that. Uh, let's return to our panel now for some more reaction. And Craig Hughes, to come to you first. I mean, the question is, why now? Uh, we know with the pandemic that the industry was fairly decimated. Night nightlife was really suffering and it was uh, on its knees um, in terms of an industry. But there's been lobbying around this for some 15 years or so, maybe more. Yeah, I mean, I think there's an acceptance that our laws are really out of kilter with the rest of Europe. I mean, the existing legislation goes back 100, in some cases 200 years. So I think it's about time it was reviewed. And I think it would make sense for it to be reviewed in a kind of shorter period than that again going forward. I also think there's great appetite for it. And I think you've also seen the impact of what the laws um, had. I mean, Minister McIntyre gave figures today that 20 years ago, there were over 500 nightclubs in Ireland. Now there's only 80. So you see the real impact, impact that has. And, and as your speaker said there in the VT, I mean, the costs that are associated with the current licensing laws, I think it's 410 euro for every special exemption order you want to get each night. I mean, no wonder there's so many nightclubs going out of business. Yeah, so I suppose this is all to streamline all, all of that and make it simple. And essentially that nightclubs can stay open to 6am uh, if they wish to. Um, Sheena Gilhini, just to get your view on this, I suppose you're from Alcohol Action Ireland in the name, is, is to take action on, on curbing alcohol use or drinking responsibly. So there's a lot of fanfare around this announcement today. Uh, what are your views on it? Well, we would have a concern about increasing licensing hours because all the evidence from right around the world at many, many different jurisdictions is that if you increase um, availability of alcohol, you increase alcohol use. And as you increase alcohol use, you get more harms from it. And uh, we, we can certainly see that um, from a licensing hours perspective, the longer that uh, premises are open for, the more harm there is. And there's many studies that, that would show that. What about what we were hearing um, uh, from Sunil there, um, who was speaking to Kira about the, the impact on the industry and all of that, saying what's actually happening is a lot of people are drinking at home because they can't stay out late, they can't stay out to all hours. They're curtailed, in essence, on what they can do on a night out. So they're drinking more at home. We know it's cheaper to drink at home as well. And that that's what's you know, sparking problems around some of these you know, major issues, increased levels of violence, domestic violence, and all of these things that you're rightly concerned about. Uh, absolutely. And I mean, certainly we do have a concern about cheap alcohol that's available, you, you know, through supermarkets and whatever. So I, I, I do agree with that. And I do agree that actually it is better to be in a, in a more controlled environment. But I come back to the evidence is that the longer that you have for opening hours, the more harm that you would see. You certainly won't find anybody, you know, working in the health service, working in EDs, working, you know, like at the coal face of actually dealing with alcohol harm, who's saying we think this is a good idea. And in fact, actually, if you ask around the country, I just saw a poll earlier on there today, you know, um, actually there's, there's fairly widespread concern about this. Um, we also know from other, you know, there's polling data there just today mm. saying something like 46% of people are, are opposed to it. But we know already that people feel quite unsafe uh, on the streets um, right. here in Ireland. Okay. And I think that's an important thing to take into account. Yeah, what about what Sheila has to say there, that people, you know, already, maybe there is that feeling of a lack of safety on our streets. We talk about that all, all of the time. And then we know we have this problem with alcohol in the country as well. So where does this new legislation fit into all of that, Jennifer? Well, Can you see the concern? of groups like Alcohol Action Ireland, where they're coming from? One of the reasons that we have difficulty is everybody leaving late night bars at the same time, exactly, instead of in a more staggered way over the night, in a more natural way over the night, which of course leads to public order problems with everybody coming out at the same time, also leads to significant transport issues. And I think, you know, there's a lot of focus on nightclubs and staying open till 6am. I think in reality, that's going to be a much smaller part of this. This is really about streamlining the process generally across the country, making it easier to make applications making the, uh, the opening hours for pubs streamlined across the country. But I think what's really important is where there is an application for something new, there will be a strong measure of local involvement. It's going to be done in the district court now instead of the circuit court. You're going to be able to bring in local people, local authorities, local communities, local health representatives to make sure that there isn't an over-concentration, to make sure it's the right balance. So I think while there's a lot of focus on nightclubs and so on, and that, be, you know, it'd be great to have a much more vibrant nighttime economy, particularly in the cities, I think there are no nightclubs at the moment in Galway, mm. with one of them <coughs> having closed. So, but, but this is, it's not all about that. It is just about streamlining the process and making it more consistent and easier for people to run a business, to hire people and to have it. A, 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 you've seen some of the, the outlier examples there with, 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 with the people on the panel, with Sunil. 
Uh, David, does Sinn Féin see this as good news? Um, we've talked about it for years. We've heard about, you know, back to actually Michael McDool talking about cafe culture and that he'd like to see that um, in Dublin city centre and elsewhere. And sure, that never came about. Um, what side are you on with this one? Uh, well, I think it is good news. I, I welcome most of the changes. Uh, the answer to the question why now is because the laws are archaic. They're 200 years old and I think a reform of the licensing laws is well overdue. We've campaigned for it for a long number of years. It's a long time, Claire, since I was in a nightclub. I'm not sure about you or anybody else on the panel. I would say long before COVID. But my experience is that when oh, you'll people... you have to just speak for yourself well, there, David. I might have, I might have really to go well, again. Sure. But my experience is that when people spill out onto the streets and have to, it does cause public order disturbances and antisocial behaviour. And it has long been argued that to have the, the mm. nightclubs open longer would help in that. Do, do you think, um, harking back to what Sheila was saying there, though, that communities might be concerned, you know, a sense on the ground that if you can have clubs staying open until 6am and pubs staying open until 12.30, there's going to be a lot more noise, there's going to be a lot more action. It, didn't, it won't just end at 2.30, 3am, it could go on till, you know, beyond the early oh, hours and into breakfast all, time. I understand all of those arguments, but equally, we have people who are going to house parties, it's uncontrolled environments, there's lots of stabbings, mm. lots of incidents that take place in house parties. I think it's better that we have people drinking in a controlled and regulated environment, and I think we have to treat people like adults. There is a broader issue in relation to alcohol dependency which needs to be addressed, but these laws are archaic, and it's not often that I would agree with Jennifer or Fine Gael or the government, but on this issue I think we do need to review the laws. Uh, many of the changes in relation to the licensing laws themselves, the licensing fees, will reduce costs. I think all of that is, is for the good and I think we have to treat people like adults. Okay. This is a, sorry, if I could just say it's an important piece for rural Ireland as well because there are pubs that have closed all over the country where before it was really, really difficult to get the licence and to reopen those. This is going to make that much easier to make a, you know, a centre in a community that was there that can be reopened and can be done much more easily, much more cheaply. Maybe somebody wants to open it as a cafe during the day, as a bar in the evening, but we're trying to revitalise rural Ireland in so many different ways. These places have been the centre of community in lots of different ways and it's and, and this this is a big step to make and that I think easier. a cultural amenity license where you can That's have a point. small cultural event That's and you can have a, a bar for maybe an hour beforehand or an hour afterwards yeah. is a good move. That's as the well. next thing because we are hearing a lot about the, the cultural offering um, that this brings as well, Craig. How do you think it will improve all, all of that? And I suppose to talk to you as well, like you have your, your day job, you're here yeah. on that, but also you run a music festival. Craig Fest. <laughs> Craig Fest, I think it's called. Uh, no, day and night festival I think it is in, in County Roscommon is that right so look you'll know about even bringing rural communities together um, and, and how do you think this legislation will mm -hmm. change and improve uh, that cultural offering yeah so the night and day festival they have in, in, in Roscommon um, for, so the process we would have had to go through is that we had to get an existing bar license from from a, a pub that and then they weren't able to operate that weekend now they happen to be closed anyway and then we also had to get an occasional dancing license um, and, and pay like 150 euro for that um, and it just shows how ridiculous uh, the system is that had to be attached to a specific part of the festival so technically it was on the main stage so technically you're only allowed dance if you're at the main stage so it just goes to one level of how absurd it is at the moment um, so the focus wasn't on alcohol and yet you had to go through all these hoops just in order to stay open late or to operate with with a, with a crowd in a particular setting exactly and now my understanding on, on the changes that are coming they're not going to be that much different when it comes to, to festivals I think the dance the occasional dancing license might be removed I think there's another interesting aspect of, of, of these laws when it comes to cultural institutions so this is a bit different to the way festivals will, will be treated so where you could get a one-off license or, or even an annual license for like if you wanted to have an event in an art gallery or something like that so it just gives provision for that to stay open again and serve alcohol in the same times so that pubs will be allowed to stay open until yeah Sheila on that and we are hearing that this isn't just about going out and drinking yourself into oblivion and staying out till 6am um, in order to do that but that there is you know a cultural aspect to all of this apart from people who run nightclubs saying look this is this is part of the dance culture that is now being decimated in this country and that we need to we need to bring that back to life but also the likes of you know museums galleries other things that they can they have a little <coughs> bit more leeway and leniency about how they operate see one of the things that i i find you know really quite uh, it's puzzling because there's just this assumption that uh, in order to enjoy yourself in order to have a cultural experience there has to be alcohol along with it and that's just simply not the case but that is what what 
really all of our, our, uh, our panellists here are, are saying tonight. And I would also point to that there is such a strange dichotomy in the government. So we have the Department of Health through the Public Health Alcohol Act actually looking to reduce the level of alcohol use by 20% in, in the country. And that's been done through the Public Health Alcohol Act, which has not been implemented. Now, this, that, that legislation is there since 2018. We have a long way to go before it's actually fully implemented, particularly around uh, the advertising of alcohol and the marketing of it. So that's one end of the government. And then the other end over here in the Department of Justice are saying, liberalise things, make alcohol more widely available, make many more spaces available for alcohol. And there's just a complete mismatch. And what we would be saying is we really need to have a central agency within the heart of government that actually looks at all aspects of alcohol. Mm -hmm. So you I don't have these strange the point, mismatches um... uh, of, in policy. And, and on top of that, I think we really need to um, gather the data properly and really measure if we're going to introduce you know, changes that are, that are being proposed. Talk about the impact that those changes yes. will have. Yeah, and I think yes. just on, on that point, this will work its way through the Justice Committee of the Oireachtas. I think all of those legitimate concerns that Sheila has raised will obviously be debated. I think we have to hear from mm -hmm. all voices, all stakeholders. There is a balance to be struck. But at the end of the day, we're talking about laws which are archaic, are 200 right. years old. But and I think that most of the changes which are being recommended, I would support. Um, to respond to what Sheila has to say, Jennifer, about you know what looks like double standards that you're you know in action um, as 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 groups who would you know look for more action on you know alcohol reducing harm campaigns yeah. versus liberalising it all and opening having a, a drinking free for all. But I think what we're trying to say, potentially. you know, I, I don't agree that they're competing. What we're trying to do is create regulated environments. And there are shops all over the country that people have seen have, have at their own cost, put up huge segregated areas to make alcohol less available, less visible um, within shops. And, 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 and that is being of implemented course it will, right across. It will change off license hours as well. Because they're going yeah, to be small, they're yes going, in, a, in a small way. But, but what we have and... in with the with provision for for this is creating more regulated spaces where you have to have you, you know you have to get a license you have to renew that on an annual basis you have to be of good character it can be enforced by the Gardaí there's much stronger enforcement mechanisms for people who are not managing this properly but what we have at the moment is a completely unregulated drinking culture where we have incentivized people to stay at home now COVID didn't help that, mm. frankly. But we don't create different spaces. I mean, I don't agree that, you know, we, we were control you know we're trying to incentivize alcohol everywhere it would be lovely to go to a cultural event and have the adult choice as to whether to have a glass of wine or not i can stay at home or anybody can stay at home and have as many glasses of wine as, as they wish it's about trying to create a measure of, of choice um, and, and and personal responsibility and personal choice in it but what we have at the moment is too unregulated and we have very little way of gathering data in relation to that and we're trying to get the balance right to make it more streamlined but also encourage people into more regulated okay. safe environments quake with all of this you know there there will be many people who say this is great that's brilliant i can go out and business is saying that this will save us but there is extra resourcing that's required if you're going to stay open to 6 a.m like in the area of public transport and um, ensuring that there are taxis there for everyone and um, increase guard the presence for some you know communities next to nightclubs next to late night venues yeah, I mean, this was put to Minister McIntyre earlier, um, and, and she was saying that the Gardaí are saying that the biggest issue is when there's uh, large large crowds gathering at once, and to disperse that would help. I think, you know, I, I lived in Berlin for a while, where this, we're look, looking towards a Berlin model, and I think it's the big elephant in the room here is that, you know, a city like Berlin has, has excellent public transport. You know, at, at the moment, not only can you not get public transport home at night, you can't even get a taxi if you want to. So it is very difficult to see how, how, uh, how, how you put the cart before the horse on this one. I got a taxi coming out to the studio and the taxi driver was making the point that uh, the worst nightmare for them is everybody spilling out onto the street at the same time. Mm -hmm. They're having staggered opening hours or people coming out at different times is actually best for, for that sector. Yeah. There are challenges for staff. I, I would accept that as well. So all of these issues will have to be talked through. There has to mm -hmm. be engagement with trade unions and stakeholders. And I think all of that will be done as part of that uh, process as this works its way through but the Gen Oireachtas. Yeah, Jennifer, on the issue of, say, aside from taxis, public transport, we don't have 24-hour public transport in this country. No. So if people want to go out and 
and stay out, it's not necessarily easy to get home after that night out. That's right. We don't and we should, particularly in the cities. And I don't disagree with you on that. But that doesn't mean that we don't make these changes where we, we get people coming out in a more controlled way over a long period of time between midnight and 6am instead of Do you expect to see changes? Everyone... Do you expect to see the Department of Transport coming in and saying, right, well, look, now that yes. we are making these licensing law changes, we're going to... I think that needs to happen anyway, policies. to be honest with you. There's people working in different ways who, yeah. who need to access that. They're not codependent, but that has to happen anyway. But I think that taking the pressure off everybody coming out or the large body of people coming out at the same time, maybe before they're ready to, uh, and having to get a taxi or trying to get on a train or, you know, a bus at the same time, Nightlink or whatever, doesn't work. All right, that's all we have time for. And that, my thanks to Jennifer Cowan-McNeil and Sheila Gilhini. Uh, David and Craig will be joining me later.